Okay. All right, so I'm going to do the renormalization group in condensed matter physics, which I've already done, but for your benefit, I'll redo it. Also, I'll do an example that I didn't do mm -hmm. in class, which I, I'm actually, I'd actually like to know what you think of the example, because I'm thinking of um, trying to publish it, actually. Um, it, it's, um, it's about confinement, not oddly enough. All right, so the idea is in condensed matter, We're interested in L um, much greater than the lattice spacing or the size of the molecules that make up the, uh, the system. We're interested in immersion properties that occur when you look at, uh, when you look in the bulk so at large length scales. Big L is some characteristic large length? Yeah. Thanks. And so let's, let's um, consider a sort of generic action well, just sum on n, where we have just a bunch of coupling constants. Okay, for example, g2 phi squared would be a half m squared phi squared. Well, I'm, I'm using two different. This, this is already this m squared. And that, I'm, I'm, so let us say, and these are equivalent. Right. And um, for example, g4 phi to the fourth might be lambda phi to the fourth over 24. This is not square left. Right? Yeah, um, but 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 we, we can also think that we're in the continuum. Okay. Well, yeah. All right. Now we can imagine defining a partition function z of lambda, which is an integral lambda e to the minus s d phi. But what does the lambda mean? The lambda means that all these phi's are so we're integrating over fields that uh, have an upper limit, an ultraviolet cutoff of lambda. All right now. So effectively, k squared less than lambda squared. Okay. Now, correspond. So that's that, that's the real that's the partition function we start with, and uh, it should be very insensitive to lambda. Um, in other words, lambda is of the order of one over a, and we're really interested in things that occur on much larger uh, length scales. So we're going to do the following. We're going to define phi sub L of x as some scale factor which we'll determine times phi of x over L, where here L is greater than or equal to 1 is dimensionless. And this is, this I'm going to call a stretched field. And we're going to half integrate over these and um, okay now this phi sub L what is it going to be? It's going to be A of L and now we do phi of X over L so this is an integral lambda e to the i k X over L phi of k e d k over 2 pi to the d so you see this effectively has changed the cutoff in a sense. In other words, where you can either think of it as stretched, so it's x over L, or you can think of it as the same O, but with uh, k now reduced by a factor L. And in particular, let's suppose that phi of x well, looked like this on some scale here, 
uh, B. Then phi sub L of X is going to be this phi of X over L, and so it gets down to zero when? When X over L is equal to B, or X equal to LB, and so it looks instead like this, if L is something like, say, 5. I wish I had another index in there. I would have liked to have said LBJ. Um, that was a constant refrain back in the 60s. There's also this A factor in front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. The amplitude gets... I left, sorry. I left that out. Well, I mean, I, 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 I mean, it's there, but um, I just didn't want to write it. I wanted to emphasize that the thing really is a stretched field. Is that what keeps it from actually becoming higher at the max? Well, we'll see what it does. The, the A of L, what we're going to do is we want to keep the kinetic term the same. And then we'll see that the coupling constants change as we stretch more and more. All right, so let's... Okay, so the partition function now is the fact we can write it as z of lambda over L, and this is, we can think of it as just scaling that, e to the minus s d phi, but what we really are doing is e to the minus s, wow, what a typo. No, that isn't a typo, it's actually correct. This, the problem is I'm using big D for the dimension of space time and big D for, and that's bad notation. Right? So something's got to be done here. All right, let's look at the kinetic action of the stretched field. Well, the kinetic action then is the integral d of x a squared of l over 2 partial p of x over l partial x squared. And now we can rewrite that as dd of x over l times l to the d a squared of L over 2, and now partial P X over L, partial X over L, we put an L here. And so this whole thing is an integral dD X over L, L to the D minus 2, A squared of L over 2, partial x over l, partial x over l, squared. And so now if we're, we, we call x over l x prime, then this is l to the d minus 2 a of l squared times uh, an integral d d x prime, um, um, partial p of x prime, partial x prime squared with the one half. Okay, so what we want is we want the dependence of a on l to cancel this, and so that means that a of l should be chosen as l to the minus d minus 2 over 2. So I'm, do you have any questions about the beginning? So, uh, I'm just trying to follow, catch up where we are. I'm not quite sure where we are. <laughs> All right, well, well, what I'm trying to do is, we're looking at condensed matter and the renormalization group in condensed matter. The idea is that we're interested in length scales that are uh, big compared to 
the lattice spacing or the size of the molecules we're interested in. Bulk properties that emerge in the bulk, like boiling point, melting point, conductivity, and so forth. Um, this, unfortunately, I used L here as a dimensional variable, and now I'm using a dimensionless L over here. So let's just say that we're interested in uh, scales, distances, much greater than that. And I'm taking a generic action, very generic. We're half integrating with an ultraviolet cutoff, but now we're introducing stretched fields. And the stretched field is some scale factor that we're determining times phi of x over l. This is the stretched field. So if the ordinary field looks like this, the stretched field looks like that. Well, apart from the scale factor, which is a of l, we choose the scale factor so that the Kinetic action remains invariant. And it's in it's chapter 18, section 3 of the online book. All right, so, so that's the value of L. And um, so what happens to the action? Well, the action is an integral dd of x, a half d phi where this has remained invariant, but now we have the sum gn of l phi n of a phi to the n. And what is gn of l? Well, gn of l is going to be um, an l to the d that comes out of here. Just like the l to the d that came out when we let x go to x over l. So it's an L to the D, but now it's A to the N of L times some GN of, say, 1. And, um, let's see if you Okay, so that means that gn of L is L to the d minus n d minus 2 over 2 gn of set 1. And um, so this is how the coupling constants vary. Uh, and we can define, if you want, a beta function, beta of gn and in condensed matter, one defines it as L over GN of L, D GN of L, uh, DL, and this just is just D minus, it's just the exponent. Okay. So then what you do is if, if this beta function is positive, or in other words, if the exponent is positive, then as L increases, these couplings become important. Those are relevant. If the exponent is negative, they're irrelevant because as you go to larger distance scales, they disappear. And if it's zero, they're called, they said to be marginal. OK, let me now apply this, this, this technique to QCD. So that means that you would, so you've got your action, and you know what the, the uh, the terms that are polynomial in the field look like. And then you would pick a large enough L such that you kill off all the ones with a negative exponent, and then you would just study the, the remaining ones? Yeah, you do, you, you, in other words, you could, you could basically take, I mean, to look at the theory at the largest distance scales, you keep the kinetic and you keep the one that was most relevant, I would say. Okay. The highest order. Yeah, and um, the highest exponent. Yeah. And um, analyze that theory. In fact, that's what I'm going to do for QCD now. And let, let me just mention the, the key thing, which, oddly enough, I've, I've only seen this in the literature once, and it was in Mike Kreutz's papers. Namely, that the thing that's striking about QCD is that it's a theory in which there are massless charged particles, namely the gluons. They have color charges, 
and they're massless. The quarks now are nearly massless, the, the U and the D, but still the, the, the estimates that come from the people who specialize in quark masses, the estimates are that the mass is of the order of an MeV or something. So, um, uh, so what you, the ones that are really massless are the blue ones. And, um, all right, so now let's look at um, the cubic term, which is G F A B C, and I'm going to look at a particular gluon term, namely A A time component, A B space component, and a time derivative of A C, again, space component. So this is one term in the action, and uh, I want to look at what it is. And now I'm going to stretch space. but be time alone. Okay. So that means, first of all, what is this thing? This thing is cubic, so n equals 3. And I'm also setting d equal to 3. Okay. So how is this coupling going to vary? And notice this is a time derivative, so we can ignore the derivative character. So this is just simply cubic with d equal to 3. Well then, the effect of coupling here, which I can call this g, g sub l is effectively, it's, well it's l to the d minus n over 2, d minus 2, and this is now l to the 3 minus 3 over 2, d minus 2 is 1, so this g. This is L to the 3 halves G. So as we scale to larger distances, the coupling gets stronger. And notice this is a non-perturbative argument. When we, were <laughs> when we were dealing with the uh, renormalization group in QCD or in either lattice or normal QCD, and those examples are also in this chapter 18, um, it was perturbative, and so we could we could analyze the beta function as, you, as we went up in energy and the coupling went down, but we couldn't say what happened in the other direction when the coupling when the when the when the um, energy went down and the coupling got stronger. Perturbation theory breaks down, so we can't say anything. Here, this is a perturb this is independent of perturbation theory. And so let's look at the force then, at a, uh, the strength of the force at some distance scale times this dimensionless parameter. And what is it? Well, it's going to be alpha s and LR0 over LR0 squared. This is just the Coulomb force between two quarks. But now, as this scales, it goes as L cubed alpha s of R0 over L R0 squared, which is L R0 alpha s of R0 over R0 cubed. Is alpha related to G? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alpha is G squared. Okay. Yeah, great point. <laughs> I. Holy Christ, I forgot to say that. <laughs> so alpha s, of course, is g squared over 4 pi. Duh. All right. So um, this is telling us that the force is, is, is getting stronger with distance. In fact, it gives us a harmonic potential which is actually very nice for doing uh, the structure of hadrons because you can calculate the energy levels of a harmonic potential. It's the harmonic oscillator all over again. And um, whereas the, the best 
I mean, the, the lattice gauge theory people will tell you that it's a linear potential. I never really trust. I mean, I went through the lattice gauge theory and I gave you the standard party line on it, but I never really trusted it. Um, and experimentally, one doesn't know because um, when you get out, if the if the if the potential really is harmonic, once you get out over here and you're trying to tell is it linear, well, because it, it wouldn't look like that, it would look like this. It would look something like that. So you'd be here, it's coulombic, then it's linear, and then it's quadratic. By the time you get anywhere out here, you have part of the creation and you can't examine the thing experimentally, so you don't know if it's so, is this the idea of pulling? There's no experimental evidence, in other words. Pulling the quarks apart and then things popping out of it. Well, yeah, you certainly get confinement if this is, in other words, this gives us confinement with a margin of safety. It gives us over confinement. All right, enough about that. I'm, um, I sent it actually to Lichtenberg. He said it was intriguing. And, um, I remember about 30 years ago, I showed him something that I thought was airtight, and he thought it was irrelevant. <laughs> so, um, sort of a matter of okay. So, any any more questions? Any questions about this, or shall I just? Let's go now uh, back to condensed matter physics and look at superfluids. Remember last time I did, I showed you what field theory looks like at uh, what the non relativistic limit is of a relativistic field theory. And um, in particular, then, let's look at a Let's imagine that this is our Lagrangian I, our non-relativistic Lagrangian I, phi star D0 phi minus 1 over 2m grad phi star dot grad phi uh, minus g squared phi star phi minus rho bar squared. Okay. So this is the Lagrangian we're using for the Super fluid, and um, this is one with spontaneous symmetry breaking. And so, phi, then we can imagine we can write a square root of rho e v i theta. This is an awfully funny um, notation, but it's the one that um, Z used, so I'm, I'm following it. Um, if we make this substitution in here, we'll get a term i over 2 d0 rho, but this is a total derivative, so we can ignore it. And uh, what we've got left then, after um, keeping track of the various 2s and 1 halves that occur because of the square root of rho rather than rho, what we get is rho theta dot minus 1 over 2m, 1 over 4 rho, grad rho squared, plus rho grad theta squared, minus g squared, rho minus rho bar squared. And now we'll, we'll make another change. We'll say square root of rho, square root of rho bar, plus h, where h is small, and um, so the mean value of phi then is square root of rho bar, and it's much greater than h. And eventually, one finds that L is minus 2 square root of rho bar h theta dot minus rho bar over 2m grad theta squared minus 1 over 2m grad h squared minus 4 g squared rho bar h squared. Okay, plus other terms, which I'm going to ignore. All right. Now, recall that when we discussed path integrals, 
we um, learned that e to the minus one half phi k phi plus j phi d phi was e to the one half j k inverse j. So we're integrating. Think but is the gap, gas integral type stuff? Excuse me? Is this like a gas Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is certainly a Gaussian right yeah. here. And uh, mm -hmm. then there's a linear term. And uh, I mean, this this is the first thing I do in the first few pages of the chapter on path Isn't there so, like a determinant or something? Huh? Isn't there like a determinant? Is K a matrix or? Um, good point. Is there a determinant in? In there, um, I think maybe it's that we're just dealing with one field, and so there's no determinant yet. But the but phi is complex. That, right? I mean, right? That's true, but it's only one complex. Right, no, forget the either we're going to ignore the determinant or it's not there. All right. <laughs> and so what we're going to do, and actually this is something to keep this. No, that's, I mean, that is the determinant in the, in the one-dimensional case. I mean, right. plus, I don't care about pies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, 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 all right. right. There's some constant. Good power. Right. To tell you the truth, I got this out of the appendix in Z's book mm -hmm. and just copied it. I didn't go to my book and see what the, what the, what I think the answer is. So I just trusted him. And, Okay, now, what we're going to do now is actually something to really pay attention to because it's done in many places in, uh, in, 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 in fancy field theory. We're going to integrate out the, uh, the H field. Okay? Because you see we have an H that's quadratic, quadratic, Forget about it, or linear. Okay. So what we did was we, and the top line on that board is we, uh, so row, we square our, to row is square to row bar plus eight. So then we're expanding around row bars. So yeah, yeah, H yeah. Is small, Absolutely. Yeah. Small H is there. small. Or and then, um, so we're integrating out that field. Okay. And when we integrate out, we use this formula. And so let's um, just say what these different things are. J is minus 2 square root of rho bar theta dot. Okay. There's J. It's whatever multiplies H. H being phi. Alright. And K over 2 is equal to 4g squared rho bar minus grad squared over 2m. Uh, there's a, we integrate by parts so that this looks like theta grad squared theta. And this is the inverse operator to that operator. And you might say, mm -hmm. I don't even know what the inverse operator minus grad. We're going to drop the grad squared over 2m. So it's complicated, but forget about it. <laughs> so, uh, and, and why are we going to drop it? Because m is big right, compared to the, uh, the momentum scale that we're looking at. All right, so when we integrate out, what we get is that ln is going to be let me keep this term at least temporarily. Minus rho bar over 2m grad theta squared. And then everything else should be plus 1 half jk inverse j. And that turns out to be minus rho bar over 2m grad theta squared. Now, if we keep everything at the moment, it's rho bar theta dot 
1 over 4g squared rho bar minus grad squared over 2m theta. Theta, 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 theta. What happened to the term? It's the a theta dot, actually. Theta dot. What happened to the term that was linear in H? Oh, that's the point. The, the term that's linear in H is um, H corresponds to phi, and the coefficient is J. Mm -hmm. J is minus 2 rho bar theta dot. Right. And so we get two J's, see, theta dot, theta dot. We get two square to rows. That gives you. Oh, I see. We're writing that out. A square to rho bar, that gives you rho bar. And um, the other term just comes through because it doesn't have right. an H, right? All right. And now we're going to ignore the term that was in any case mysterious. And what we have now is L is equal to theta dot squared over 4g squared. <coughs> Even the rho bar cancels. And then minus rho bar over 2m grad theta squared plus Rho bar is a scalar field, right? Rho bar is a constant. Oh, it's a constant. It's the rho bar. What the hell's a field in here? Rho bar. Rho bar is just a constant. Oh, I see. Okay, rho was a scalar field. Yes. And then we're saying rho is some constant with some small other field. Right. Okay. Rho uh, is essentially rho bar. Rho bar is a constant. Here, let me give you your... Now I'm not as confused. I don't know. I mean, I reach in here and that's what I've done. So let's look now at what the equation of motion is for theta. So there's one field left and that's theta. One field left. <laughs> it's dimensionless. It's an angle. And the equation of motion then is theta double dot over 4g squared is rho bar over 2m grad squared theta. That's the equation of motion. And or just looking at it, looking at the Lagrangian, it just involves derivatives, so it's a massless field. So theta is massless. And um, what is the uh, dispersion? What, 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 I mean, if we say let theta be e to the i omega t minus k dot x, then what is this going to tell us? This is going to say minus omega squared over 4g squared is equal to rho bar over 2m minus k squared. And so we get that omega squared is 2g squared rho bar over m times k vector squared. So this is our, as people say, this is our dispersion relation. Um, this thing, this thing, this is a massless phonon. Nice. Okay. And moreover, this is a relation that was derived by Bogolubov. Which is spelling that is harder than it is. <laughs> of course. So now, Landau then made use of this to explain super, superfluidity, and his argument is just uh, simplicity itself. And uh, of course, in fact, this whole this whole thing is in the spirit of the Landau Ginzburg approach to condensed matter physics. All right, so let's consider a mass m. A fluid moving at velocity v. And suppose
suppose it loses some momentum. Well, then conservation of momentum gives us mv prime plus h bar k. But we need conservation of momentum. So we need 1 half mv squared to be greater than or equal to 1 half mv prime squared plus h bar omega of k. Otherwise, if it were, otherwise you, 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 you wouldn't have enough energy to make the phone up. Okay. Now, if you solve this thing, in other words, you, you write V prime in terms of V and K, the square here, substitute it into this equation and analyze it, what you find can we think of the phonons as like radiation here? Well, it's massless, so yeah, you can. But notice what happens. This inequality turns into V dot K greater than equal to omega. So this is what you get. And this is an interesting condition because what this means is that the length of V has got to be greater than omega over the length of k. Uh, but what is omega over the length of k? Well, omega is given by this thing here. So this is square root of 2 g square root of rho bar k over square root of m, k. So this means that the velocity has to be greater than or equal to, well, why don't I read it all from this, g square root of 2 rho bar over m, which we can call v critical. So in, in the energy conservation, or, well, not exactly conservation, conservation. But where does the, if it's not an equality, where is, where is that extra energy? Where did it go? On the, the third line on the left board? Oh, I don't know. I think turbulence or something. Um, but you could account for it. Well, the idea, I don't know. This didn't, huh? It just doesn't give a particular matter where, where it goes. It's just saying right. we need at least this much energy. You need at least this much energy for this to happen. And that gives you that the speed has to be greater than some critical velocity. To create so that, huh? To create phonons. Right. And so that means, all right, so let's see, I don't know how much you missed, but the point is we have a critical velocity here. The, the mass of fluid can't lose, can't radiate phonons, can't lose momentum unless the speed is higher than some critical velocity. So that means at low speed, it just slides without friction. It's a superfluid. Um, another way of thinking about it is that um, there are too few low energy modes for the superfluid to lose energy and momentum too. All right, so that's another way of thinking about it. And I owe people candy. Mm. Is there any sort of analogy with the photon radiation of the secret? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes. Who asked the last question? Who is talking? I was talking about it. Okay. And you get. Uh, Superfluid and the electromagnetic radiation from an accelerating charge. Like if there's some acceleration to the to the superfluid and it goes above that critical speed, does it start to radiate uh, phonons in the way that? Well, yeah. If it's moving faster than if it's 
moving faster than that critical velocity, then it can radiate phonons and slow down. So this this the thing is a superfluid. It's, it's going to slow. It's, it's going too fast. It's no longer super. Okay. Okay. But it does it, it does it power radiated. Uh, I, I, I don't. I mean, you, you, you're now looking for too too much detail. I don't know. All right. And this theory doesn't seem to. I mean, this has nothing to do with an acceleration. Yeah, that, that's no, the, but that's the question. Can you? Well, you could accelerate it, right? And at some point past the critical velocity, it will start. Well, to yeah, increase. yeah. You, you know, now that you now they are, are uh, yeah, you're answering it correctly. Uh, in other words, this is an acceleration because you go from v to v prime. But the point is, you can't accelerate and conserve energy and momentum unless you're at a high speed. Oh. Uh, Right, high speed. speed. High speed. If you're at a low speed, you don't radiate at all, and so you're just... Okay. So now I'm going to do the Landau-Ginsberg theory of critical phenomena. And you may notice that this is one sheet. Yes. It means it's really concise. And Two sides. So first of all, let's look at ferromagnetism. All right. I, I don't have the patience to write a long word like ferromagnetism. <laughs> um, um, we've got a magnetization, M of X. And um, the absolute value of this is going to be something like Tc minus T to the beta. Uh, and so as T approaches Tc from below, then Tc minus T is positive, and we've got some exponent there, and so the magnetization goes to zero, and so I guess if we look at the magnetization, and there's Tc, and we're below, then it, uh, I don't know, it does something like that. So. The actual value of beta, the ferromagnetism at least, in some cases is 0.37, so it's a little more than a third. It's like <coughs> two dimensions, or? I think this is three dimensions. Okay. The beta is? This, this thing is called a critical exponent. And it's a, it's a universal thing? I think just said it's not. What is it? He just said it's not. Uh, I think this is in real, a real, fer a real ferromagnet in three dimensions, I think, has beta to 0.37. Um, it just does, does beta increase or decrease with uh, uh, dimension? You're, 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 you're pushing me beyond my <laughs> knowledge of this thing. I, I, I'm not a condensed matter physicist. Let's just make that perfectly clear. And um, so what I'm doing is I'm showing you how this works in a, in a, in a very simple way. Now, you might say, well, how do you get something like this, which is basically a, a non-analytic behavior, from something that is uh, a theory in which everything is analytic? And the reason is that the partition function is an infinite sum of analytic functions. And an infinite sum of analytic functions can be non-analytic. So that's the resolution of that. Now what Landau and Ginsberg did was they took the free energy to be the volume times A times the square of the magnetization plus B times the fourth power plus other terms. And they said let A be A1 times T minus Tc. Well, you can see what happens. You're just getting spontaneous symmetry breaking because if T is less than Tc, this is negative, this term is negative, that term is positive, and so you get uh, a spontaneous magnetization, and you, in other words, you minimize the free energy by differentiating with respect to m squared, and you get zero is equal to a uh, plus um, 2b, so um, 2b m squared. So I've done that correctly. I, what is B? Yeah, this is correct. B is just this coefficient. Oh, I don't know what it is. 
Yeah. Well, how do you know that, that term's negative then? You said. Oh, we, 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 this was the inside of Landau and Ginsburg. We just let A be some positive number times T minus TC. Well, that means that if T is less than TC, then that thing's negative. But then you right, also that gives you spontaneous symmetry breaking, and so that says that M squared is equal to, let me just look at my notes here, minus A over 2B, or M is square root of minus A over 2B, but now look what A was. Minus a is um, square root of a1 over 2b times uh, tc minus t to the one half. So you get this critical exponent behavior, um, but you get the wrong critical exponent. Instead of being 0.37, you get 0.5. Okay. Still, um, you can imagine that if you screw it around with it, you might get you might get it to be a little bit better. But and what what's remarkable is the simplicity that you 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 get the rough physical behavior from this Landau Ginsburg theory just almost effortlessly. Um, we can go a little bit further than this. We can add the term that we obviously left out. We can say well. <laughs> is integral d cubed x, again we're just doing space, grab m squared plus a m squared plus b m squared squared plus, okay. And now, um, what do we have? Well, this thing, I'm going to make it shorter than what, uh, Z did, because I think you can already recognize that in this theory you can see what the propagator would be. In other words, m of x, m of zero, in the vacuum, and hell, maybe <coughs> call it, well, I, don't, I hesitate to call it a time ordered product since we haven't had, don't have any time in there, but you can see that this is going to be essentially uh, d cubed k e v i k dot x divided by these are three spatial dimensions right okay divided by uh, k squared plus a I mean it's just the so are we neglecting the the m to the fourth term yeah yeah well, yeah. well, well, well the, when we do the propagator we always neglect yeah, the m so it's the just the the ordinary propagator the scalar one but m is replaced scalar by scalar propagator yeah right That's and obvious. um and now, if we do this, what we get is um, e to the minus square root of a x over, say, 4 pi x. So the propagator looks like this. In other words, the correlation length, correlation length, in other words, if we say this is e to the minus x over c, then what is C? C is equal to 1 over square root of A, which is to say 1 over square root of uh, T minus TC. So here we've gotten, here we're at T greater than TC, and so here's what's interesting. So we've got, so here A is positive. And um, what we see is that the correlation length goes to infinity as you approach the critical temperature from above. And um, so that's that's just that's just very nice. So I mean, I, uh, in other words, you, you get all this stuff out essentially for free um, in this Landau Ginsberg approach. In fact. It's so easy that I now propose to do superconductivity in less than 20 minutes. This is again the sort of Landau Ginsberg approach. So, what we say, and let me go over here just because there's not so much space. So, we have our electrons, 
The idea of superconductivity, once again, if we want to do it in a lambda ginsburg style, we want to have some sort of a bosonic field. So we say um, two E's form a Cooper pair. So our Lagrangian is going to be in terms of this? Yes, in terms of a field, field. of the Cooper pair, Cooper pair field. Okay. And by the way, this M that we were talking about here is called an order parameter. So is phi of x. This, this is going to be our Cooper pair field. But now, because it's a charged complex field, it's, our derivative is going to be di phi, which is going to be di minus i 2e ai times phi. Why 2e? Because it's char a charge two field. So what's our free energy? Well, we take the simplest possible free energy. And it's the same photon gauge field? You got it. So the free energy is a quarter Fij squared, and this is just, uh, we're just doing things spatial, that's the magnetic field, plus di phi squared, grad phi in other words, plus a phi squared plus b phi squared, whoops, squared, squared. Alright, so this is invariant of the U1 gauge transformations where phi goes to e to the 2i, e lambda phi, and a i goes to a i plus d i lambda. So that's, that's what we're talking about. Now, we're, we're of course going to take b positive because otherwise the theory is unbounded below. And we're going to say a of t is equal to a1, which is greater than 0, times t minus tc. So this is um, positive when t is above the critical temperature, and negative when it's below. So when it's below, uh, we're going to get spontaneous symmetry breaking. But now it's the kind of spontaneous symmetry where phi it's a value in the vacuum, which again would be the equation 0 equals a plus b phi squared. Um, actually, that's a 2, isn't it? No, 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 it was b over 2. Sorry. And so now it's just b. And so the mean value of phi is square root of minus a over b, which I'm going to call v. So below the critical temperature, v gets a value in the vacuum, which I call people, because people often call a vet, but I think that's an abuse in the English language. So it's a mean value in the vacuum. And um, in that case, what does the free energy look like? Well, it's going to be a quarter Fij squared, but now it's going to be the absolute value of di phi minus i 2e ai phi squared plus the stuff we're going to ignore. Okay? But phi is, is, is the mean value in the vacuum, so what is this? This is a half b squared plus 2e, this is going to have the value of v, that v. So this is 2EV squared times AI squared. So that means that the photons acquired a mass, one half M squared is 2EV squared. Okay. So now we look at the Meissner effect. The Meissner effect is that the superconductor excludes magnetic field. And why is that? Well, B, of course, is curl A, which is fine if A is massless, but now there's a term in the Lagrange in the free energy that's proportional to A squared as well as B squared. And uh, suppose we just have simply A equal to some B0 R phi hat in, say, I don't know, cylindrical or spherical coordinates then Bz is equal to B0 
But now what is this? This then is equal to a half b zero squared plus two e v squared b zero squared r squared. And so you see as r grows, you get an awful lot of energy. It's this fact, that's r, not r hat. And so that means that, uh, the, I mean, this would be infinite, in fact. So if you had a magnetic field, and then you just have an infinite amount of energy. So that's, um, that's why the superconductor excludes um, magnetic field. This is called the Meissner effect. And uh, so now London computed what the penetration depth would be. And um, I'm going to do this um, very, very casually. I'm going to say A is equal to A0 e to the minus X over L, where X is the penetration into the superconductor. Then B is going to be of the order of A0 over L e to the minus X over L. And now the free energy is of the order of a half a0 squared over l squared e to the minus 2x over l uh, plus 2ev squared a0 squared e to the minus 2x over l. Well, what, what, is, what is x? X is distance inside the superconductor. Okay. So in other words, you have some, here's our, superconductor and you have some magnetic field B there and you go in a certain distance and you imagine it falls off exponentially. And so now we integrate in. So you get that the integral of F dx is then um, A0 squared 1 over 2L squared plus 2EV squared times L over 2. And so you're trying to minimize something with the form 1 over 2L plus 2EV squared L. And uh, so F is proportional to that. You minimize that and you get um, 0 equals minus 1 over 2L squared plus 2EV squared, or 2L squared is 1 over 2EV squared. So we get that L is equal to 1 over 2 root 2EV. So I'll put an L for, for L for London there. The so that's, the, that's roughly the order of the penetration. The temperature dependence is stuck inside of V? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, now let's look at the coherence length. Well, for the coherence length, we just go back here and we see the coherence length is going to be 1 over square root of minus a. So the, so L sub phi is 1 over square root of minus a. And this is because we're below the critical temperature? Right. 1 over square root of minus a, and now the ratio of the London length of this. to the coherence length. A minus a, it's In other words, it's the same business over here. It's the same as the correlation length. It's the same, yes, it's, absolutely. But now t is below the critical temperature instead of above it? Yeah. Um, well, you could always say, I, 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 what I, are you talking about here again? <laughs> I, I must like say that I... I must so say that I, um, I was a little casual about the sign of A. Um, I think that's, I think it's right here. If you're below the critical temperature, then you definitely want it to be high the sign there, unless you want your penetration depth to be negative. Yeah, well, A is negative, mm -hmm. right. So we're definitely below the critical. Uh, yeah. 
Oh, that's all right, all right. So we had minus a here and a there, and it's worse. Yeah, okay. Good, thank you. There you were, Candy. So the ratio is 1 over e, square root of b over minus a, square root of minus a, so altogether it's square root of b over e. And another way of thinking about it is square root of minus a over e v, which is the mass of the phi field divided by the mass of the photon. What is L phi? L phi is the coherence length. In other words, oh, it's, okay. it's this C. The mass of the photon? The, yes, the photon acquires a mass in the superconductor. <clears throat> Okay, well that actually is all um, I was going, I thought that I had too much to cover in, in one lecture, but somehow um, these ideas are so bite-sized that um, I managed to get through this. Uh, so why don't you guys just ask questions and we can just sort of talk about this stuff. Is Z's book the best introductory to Excuse me? Z's book? Is this what you right, mean, that's where I've been getting this, and I must say Z's book is marvelous, period. Um, what he does is he, he, see the fact is that many of these ideas, the important ideas, the really important ideas of physics turn out to be all pretty simple. And what he's done is he's He's extract. He's identified the important ideas in many areas of physics, gotten their simple essence, and expressed it clearly and briefly. And um, so that's what what I, I've been just um, basically repeating uh, what, he, what he did. And um, so I, as I said, I. It could be, of course, that you guys missed um, one of the earlier lectures, um, and you have a question about something that's on the web page, but you didn't get to ask, or you, I mean, you feel free to post questions, or we could just quit early if you want. So how does the photon get uh, acquired mass? Well, in this, in this picture, um, it's because the, the photon gauges this U1 symmetry, as you'd expect it to, what, what it does, and once the scalar field that it is, um, the scalar field whose, co the, whose covariant derivative it enters. In other words, it's, it's the same old story. You've got a covariant derivative which is an ordinary derivative, and then a gauge field times a scalar field. This is the covariant derivative of a scalar field. If the scalar field assumes a mean value in the vacuum, or let us say, instead of vacuum, we say that the lowest energy state of the system is one in which phi has a, a mean value, Not then zero. equal to v, then there's a term here that's of the form 2EV, squared times a squared. And that is the, that's the canonical simple way of, in, in which, in which um, gauge fields get mass in both condensed matter and in particle physics. So the way it this is, is the Higgs mechanism is what people say in particle physics and condensed matter, they say it's the Anderson mechanism. Nice. So the way that wouldn't happen is if the mean value of the scalar field in the vacuum was zero, right? Yeah, or okay. the low energy state was zero. Right. And that happens when A is positive. So has the condensed matter version of this actually been seen? Wait, I want to I wanna understand. <laughs> I want to understand that first. So why yeah, is this? Above the critical temperature. Oh, here. well, because, I mean, just look at this free energy here. You're yeah. Gonna, well, all right, I'm, I'm sorry. We, we, we've got two different theories on the board here. Over here, what is our F? Here's our F here. Phi, if we just had this term and this term, and we had A positive and B positive, mm -hmm. then you'd lower the energy by having phi have a mean value of zero, mm -hmm. in which case the photon would stay massless. 
And um, so when does... The sine of A flips. It's when the sine of A flips, then phi gets a mean <laughs> value and the photon gets a mass. So what and, 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 and the inside of the condensed matter people is to say that A is um, some cons positive constant times T minus TC. And that's because when, <coughs> when, um, when T is below TC, A is negative, you can have spontaneous similar right. ranking, but not above TC. Right. And so, and Landau and Ginsburg realized so what that, that would if that explained all of these things, the critical exponent, the Meyer effect, the coherence length, and of course it's, done, it's doing it in such a simple way, you get a qualitative explanation, but, um, you know, you're not getting precise numbers. And so the fact that the photon is massive um, in the superconducting phase, that's what tells us that the Cooper pairs can't, can't radiate photons. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, that's a good observation. Yeah. It keeps them right. circulating. That, that is brilliant. Well, thank you. Yeah, it didn't occur to me, but you're right. That's a very good uh, point. Yes. I'll add it to my notes. <laughs> In other words, I mean, just to repeat what he's just said, it's, it's, it's kind of a little like the argument over there, perhaps. But just, just to rephrase it, um, when the photon's massless, then these charged particles have no trouble throwing off photons. But um, if the photon has a mass, then it's very hard to throw off a photon. And so, um, so the, the, these these Cooper pairs just don't radiate, and that means that uh, you have uh, effectively superconductivity. So that's 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 very good. You should send Z an email and he'll put it in his third edition. <laughs> but that that's that's a great observation. That's a very physical, very good observation. Yeah. So I was wondering. So let me, let me give out some more chocolate here. Um, you get to get to back today. Yeah, sure. Oh, I'm going to have to go to Costco and buy some more of this. Um, <laughs> see you down. All right. Yeah, you get a Milky Way. Uh, that's the. But unfortunately, all I've got left are crunches. So. <laughs> uh, devil that. <laughs> so. Oh, that's so I was wondering, has the, so when you were calling the, the uh, Anderson mechanism, yeah. has, has, are there condensed matter systems where we can actually observe that? Well, we've observed the Meissner effect, right? Yeah. You know, all these things have been observed, but, 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 like but, the, course, but the, we can observe particles with mass, but that doesn't mean we know the Higgs mechanism is doing it, right? Like, oh, I see. Can we, do we have experiments in condensed matter where we can kind of isolate? Well, let's be a little careful. In particle physics, we still have not seen the Higgs field. That's, that's what, what I mean. That's what I mean. We see particles with mass, but that doesn't imply that it was the, <laughs> it was the Higgs field, right? So that's what, it, have, is there kind of been the smoking gun experiment in condensed matter to show the analog? I don't know. Um, as I said earlier in this lecture, I'm, I'm just sort of describing the land I get for theory, but I haven't worked in the I mean, you're asking if they observed a massive photon field, right? <laughs> I don't know what you could, I don't know what you could do to Yeah, you, I really you can't smash them into each other. <laughs> I don't know how we observe the or try to observe the, the Higgs field. It's kinda of hard at some point. You just <clears throat> does it predict it well? Yes. Yeah, is that Good enough? enough. That makes it real, right? But <laughs> that makes it real enough to us. <laughs> I think we should ask a real condensed matter physicist. Uh, do, do we have any? Some of <laughs> we don't. Well, I don't think. <laughs> well, you better hit the red button before. <laughs> <laughs>